on World News Tonight. Pinnacle of Peace The coveted Nobel Peace Prize awarded to worthy laureates. Election pressure, new reports unveiled on the then US president for election fraud. Jab outreach, Moderna vaccine expands its domain to the continent that needs it the most. Commemorating legends, Spain pays tribute to a lost icon with an artwork on the hero stage. From the global resources of the Verona Media Network, this is Other Verona World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with some breaking news. Journalists Maria Ressa of the Philippines and Dmitry Muratov of Russia have won this year's Nobel Peace Prize, recognized for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which the prize-giving committee described as being under threat worldwide. For more on this, we have our Zerna World News special correspondent Danushka Marawansa reporting now from Tromso in Norway. Danushka? Yes, Anuradhi. Berit Reis Anderson, the chair of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, said that the duo were given the prestigious award for their courageous fight for the freedom of expression in the Philippines and Russia. At the conference in Norway's capital Oslo, Anderson mentioned that the recipients represent all journalists who stand up for such ideals in a world where democracy and the freedom of press face increasingly adverse conditions. The prize is a first for journalists since the German Karl von Ossietzky won it in 1935 for revealing his country's secret post-war rearmament program. Reza, who founded the investigative journalism website Rappler, has focused much of her work on President Rodrigo Duarte's controversial and violent war on drugs in the Philippines. Muratov founded the Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta in 1993 and has been his editor-in-chief for 24 years. Today, it is one of Russia's few independent media outlets and has seen six of his journalists murdered during this time. Soon after the announcement, the Kremlin congratulated the Russian journalist despite the fact that his newspaper has often criticized Russian authorities. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov told reporters that they can congratulate Dmitry Moritov for his bravery and for persistently working in accordance with his ideals to which he is devoted. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other there in a World News special correspondent Danish Kamarwansa from Tromso in Norway. On to the United States now, a review by U.S. Senate Democrats of Donald Trump's attempt to use the Justice Department to overturn his 2020 election defeat provided new details about an official's bid to push out the acting attorney general to advance Trump's false claims. Former President Donald Trump would have shredded the Constitution to keep his office in the presidency. A new report released Thursday laid out the lengths to which Democrats say Donald Trump pressured the Justice Department to overturn the presidential election result, including by trying to oust its top official. We were a half step away from a full-blown constitutional crisis. The review by the Senate Judiciary Committee, chaired by Democrat Dick Durbin, details how Trump was growing angry that acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen would not launch a public investigation into the false claim that Trump's defeat to now President Joe Biden was the result of widespread fraud. Rosen himself had taken the reins from William Barr, who resigned as attorney general in the weeks after the election, after publicly undercutting Trump by saying that the DOJ found no sign of systemic voter fraud. According to the Senate Review, Trump ultimately tried to remove Rosen by asking Jeffrey Bossert Clark, then a senior Justice Department official and Trump loyalist, to step into the AG role. Durbin on Thursday laid out why that didn't happen. The White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, dissented from the president's position and said it was a murder-suicide pact for him to engage in this. Secondly, at that point, the eight leading officials in the Department of Justice all signed a letter saying that they would resign en masse if there was a replacement of the acting attorney general by Mr. Clark. That meeting, Durbin said, took place on January 3rd. We know what followed. In a matter of three days, this present, former president, desperate in his situation, 
having failed in every court case, having failed to take over the Department of Justice, decided to take his cause to the streets. We saw it in the United States Capitol three days later on January 6th. The president turned loose a mob, a mob that was supposed to stop us from counting the electoral votes and electoral ballots. Republicans on the committee issued their own report, which drew different conclusions. Ranking member Chuck Grassley said Trump, quote, did what we'd expect a president to do on an issue of this importance. He listened to his senior advisors and followed their advice and recommendations. In Southern California, the first class action lawsuit has come into effect against the owners of the broken oil pipeline by businesses that say they were harmed by the massive oil spill. This comes as the U.S. gets the first look at the damaged pipeline. The first images of the splintered pipeline captured 80 feet underwater reveal the more than foot long gash where oil gushed into the Pacific. Authorities now say they're inspecting the 41 year old pipe which runs from this oil rig to shore for signs of corrosion and pressure problems. But for now, many believe the pipe was likely hit by a 30 ton anchor like this one. The fact that the pipeline appears to have been dragged leads me to conclude that it probably was caught on the ship's anchor. Reviewing satellite imagery in the hours before and after the spill, the Coast Guard will likely be able to pinpoint which cargo ships were anchored in the area, a jammed shipping lane dotted with a maze of drilling platforms. As long as you have shipping and offshore oil development operating in close proximity, this is the kind of accident and spill that you can expect to have happen. With more wildlife and pristine miles of beaches stained from this massive spill, tonight the search for answers and the probe to hold someone responsible. The beleaguered chief of Angela Merkel's CDU party signaled that he was ready to step aside as leader of the Conservatives after an election debacle that left them on the brink of opposition. Nearly two weeks after the Christian Democratic Union's worst election result in history, the party's leader Armin Laschet signals that he's ready to step down. The centre-right leader says he will resign if there is consensus in the party for a new successor. His announcement came as no surprise. Laschet has faced mounting pressure to resign in the wake of September's election debacle. In spite of suggesting that he would step down, Laschet says his CDU party is ready to form a so-called Jamaica coalition with the Free Democrats and the Greens. On Wednesday, however, the Liberal FDP and the Greens sided with the centre-left SPD, who won more than a quarter of votes during last month's election. The CDU's chances of being in government dwindled further Thursday, after what the Liberals, Greens and the Social Democrats described as a positive start to their coalition talks, increasing the likelihood that the CDP's Olaf Scholz will become Germany's next Chancellor. I sensed in the discussion that we could create something together. What we've agreed on the basis of today's good talks is that we'll continue on Monday. We'll now use the weekend to prepare an intensive week of exploratory talks. A historic three-way coalition between Germany's FDP, Greens and the SPD could end the centre-right's 16-year hold on power. But experts say that due to the complexity of a three-way coalition, it's unlikely that Germany will have a new government before Christmas. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. A powerful earthquake measuring 5.9 in magnitude struck the Tokyo region yesterday. The quake caused buildings to sway from side to side, but no serious injuries have been reported. However, train lines were stopped and the power went out in some areas. Thankfully, no tsunami was triggered. A massive earthquake with a magnitude of 5.9 shook Tokyo and surrounding areas overnight on Thursday. The quake started at around 10.40 p.m. local time in the Chiba prefecture east of the capital, registering an intensity of 5 plus on Japan's seismic scale of 0 to 7 in areas like Tokyo and Saitama. The tremors were strong enough to stop trains, burst water pipes and cause power cuts across the cities. Newly elected Prime Minister Fumio Kishida immediately set up an emergency response task force to provide everyone with the latest information. 
The quake occurred just three days after the new prime minister took office. Local outlets have reported at least 20 injuries as of early Friday morning, but no deaths or major structural damage. Japan Meteorological Agency added that the country is not at risk of a tsunami. However, they urged people in the greater Tokyo area to stay alert for the next seven days in case more earthquakes come their way. They also described Thursday's quake as the strongest to hit the capital region since 2011. In March of 2011, a 9.0 magnitude quake shook the country's northeast and damaged the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, which still remains as the world's worst nuclear crisis after Chernobyl. Japan accounts for around 20% of the world's mega earthquakes with a magnitude 6 or greater. The UK moves one step forward by relaxing travel restrictions for some fully vaccinated nations with India included in the green list. For more on this, we have other there in a world news special correspondent Dilni Seniratna reporting now from London in the UK. Yes, Anurali. Britain's Transport Minister Grant Sharps announced that Britain will scrap tough COVID-19 quarantine requirements for 47 destinations, including South Africa and Thailand. The changes will make it easier for people to arrive from countries, including India and Turkey, in the latest relaxation of the rules. The tourism industry has essentially lost two full summers after travel restrictions imposed to contain the spread of COVID-19 deterred many people from going abroad. Many countries with high infection levels were put on a red list, requiring arrivals to spend 10 days in a government-provided quarantine hotel, while the need for a PCR test and other tests often cost more than the flight itself. Seven countries will remain on the red list, including Colombia, Ecuador, Panama and Venezuela. He has also eased the rules for countries such as India, Turkey and Ghana, meaning that the inoculation status of arrivals will be recognised and fully vaccinated arrivals will only need to take a test on day two to check for COVID-19. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was Other There in the World News Special Correspondent Dilini Seniratna reporting from London in the UK. We have some good news for you. Pfizer and BioNTech have asked U.S. regulators to approve emergency use of their COVID-19 vaccine for children aged 5 to 11, and the vaccine could be ready for rollout as early as November. A COVID-19 vaccine for kids could be just weeks away. That's after Pfizer and BioNTech asked the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to approve emergency use of their vaccine for children aged 5 to 11. White House COVID-19 response coordinator Jeffrey Zients told CNN the vaccine for young children could be ready to roll as early as November. The FDA set a date of October 26th for its panel of outside advisors to meet and discuss the Pfizer-BioNTech application. It's possible for kids to begin receiving the vaccines shortly afterwards. Zients told CNN, We are ready. We have the supply. We are working with states to set up convenient locations for parents and kids to get vaccinated, including pediatricians' offices and community sites. Rapid FDA approval could help mitigate a potential surge of cases this fall, with schools already open nationwide. Children currently make up about 27 percent of all U.S. coronavirus cases and an increasing percentage of hospitalizations, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. With more good news, Moderna plans to invest up to $500 million to build a factory in Africa to make up to 500 million doses of the mRNA vaccines each year, including its COVID-19 shot, as pressure grows on the pharmaceutical industry to manufacture drugs on the continent. Facing pressure to supply COVID-19 vaccines to the developing world, Moderna says it'll build a plant in Africa. The company said Thursday it plans to invest about a half billion dollars to produce up to 500 million doses of mRNA vaccines each year, including its COVID-19 shot. It hasn't decided upon a country or location yet, but will decide soon. It said the site will also include bottling and packaging capabilities. Moderna will become the first company to build its own plant on the continent. It has supplied more than 500 million doses of its COVID-19 vaccine so far. In July, rival Pfizer and its partner BioNTech struck a deal with a South African company to make and deliver around 100 million vaccine doses a year. While the companies are ramping up to supply vaccines, they're less willing to share their technology. 
Many Western drug makers received government support to develop vaccines, but they strongly oppose calls to transfer intellectual property to make them. They argue they need to oversee any tech transfer due to the complexity of the manufacturing process. Shares of Moderna, which have fallen by a fifth in just the past five days, rose in early trading Thursday. Welcome back. And for more world news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Poland's highest court has ruled that parts of EU law are incompatible with the Polish constitution, challenging the primacy of EU law, which is a central plank of integration. In a bid to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, South Korea has drastically raised its target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The new goal seeks a 40% reduction by the end of this decade. It's been a month since Bitcoin became legal tender in El Salvador and so far people are divided over the use of the cryptocurrency with some complaining about technical irregularities occurring during transactions. The CIA has established a China mission center which says it will solely focus on China and the strategic challenges posed by Beijing. The CIA said it wants to address the global challenges posed by Beijing that are critical to US competitiveness. Hundreds of children in Kenya's malaria-prone western region were inoculated with doses of mossy cricks, the world's first approved malaria vaccine. Prosecutors allege ex-NBA player Terence Williams orchestrated the scheme to rip off the league's health benefits plan by filling false claims and recruited other players by offering fake invoices. They submitted nearly $4 million worth of claims according to the indictment. The 18 NBA veterans are accused of ripping off the league's health benefits plan by filing fake claims for medical procedures that never happened. The defendant's playbook involved fraud and deception. Prosecutors allege ex-NBA player Terrence Williams orchestrated the scheme, recruiting other players by offering fake invoices for chiropractic treatments and dental care. According to the indictment, they submitted nearly $4 million worth of claims. The health plan paid out $2.5 million. Williams allegedly got $230,000 in kickbacks from the other players. Prosecutors say the scheme unfolded from 2017 through 2020. Ex-power forward Gregory Smith is accused of seeking reimbursement for root canals in Beverly Hills when he was actually playing basketball in Taiwan. Among the others charged, Glenn Davis, Shannon Brown, and six-time NBA All-Defensive team member Tony Allen, along with his wife. Late today, Sebastian Telfair pleaded not guilty, walking out of federal court with an ankle monitor. And finally tonight, the Spanish city of Balaguer in northeastern Spain paid tribute to Kobe Bryant by painting an image of the legendary basketball star in classic yellow and purple Lakers colors on a municipal basketball court. The project is the work of Catalan artist Lucuta. Brian died in 2020 at age 41 in a helicopter crash, along with his 13-year-old daughter Gianna and seven others on board. Drone footage provided by City Council showed how this court was painted over several days with the help of the Balaguer Basketball Club. Balaguer City Council's tribute to Bryant was delayed by the coronavirus pandemic after it was designated as the capital of Catalan basketball in 2020 and will be officially inaugurated on October 17th. Bryant's former teammate at the Lakers, Catalan player Pau Gasol, who announced that he is retiring from the sport after 23 years, said on Twitter that Balaguer is a beautiful city and now it's even more so with this beautiful tribute to Kobe. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. I'll be back again on Monday with another edition of World News. Until then, I'm Anuradha Vikramasinghe. Stay safe and have a great weekend.